Let's walk through Object Explorer. Because Object Explorer has a wealth of different objects you can look at and see, I'm going to open up the property window at the same time so you can see that some of the properties will correlate to the objects we're looking at. Nearly everything you can configure about SQL Server at a server level and a database level can be done through Object Explorer. So if we talked about every detail inside of Object Explorer, we'd be here for the rest of the week. Instead, the goal here is to show you different objects within the Explorer, how to navigate it, how to find things, but I will be pointing out some interesting properties along the way. So right at the top of Object Explorer is the server. Opening up the context menu and moving down to properties. On the general page, a couple things to point out is you can see the configuration, the uh, platform, the version, how much memory is installed, how many processors, the fact that it's not clustered, and the server collation. Collation tends to uh, really be a problem sometimes, matching up different collations. This is where you can go to see this, the collation, which is the sort order of the server. On the memory page, if you're running a 32-bit installation of SQL Server, 32-bit windows can only address 4 gigabytes of memory, and it leaves 2 gigabytes free for the operating system and limits it to only 2 gigabytes per application. So if you have a large amount of memory in your server, to be able to page memory higher than 4 gigabytes, you need to turn on the AWE. So there, here's how you would do that in the server properties. You can set the minimum and maximum amount of memory that SQL Server will either begin with or a max grow to, and this is useful. It's possible to have multiple installations of SQL Server installed on a single box, and you want to be careful when you're setting the maximum server memory that you don't have memory starvation as two SQL Server instances compete for the same amount of memory. In the processor page, you can see the different processors which ones are available for SQL Server by setting the processor affinity. The security page lets you set Windows Authentication versus SQL Server and Windows Authentication mode, previously called Mixed Mode Security, and whether or not you're logging logins, turning on C2, Audit Trace. The Connections page allows you to set the default connection options. This is important because it can force recompiles of your stored procedures if the connection options are constantly changing. So you want to be able to set the default to the way you want it to behave and then go with that. The database setting page sets the defaults for databases, such as their default location and the index fill factor. When we talk about indexes, we'll talk about the fill factor in detail. In the advanced page, a couple things I want to point out. When we talk about cursors later on, we'll talk about allow cursors to fire others, which is set true or false server-wide, not just database-wide. And in the parallelism section, there's some things here to point out. The max degree of parallelism refers to the number of CPUs that can be working together in parallel to solve a query. By default, Microsoft always leaves us at zero, meaning any query can take over all of the CPUs. I've seen this cause performance problems and I would recommend setting this to the number of CPUs in the box divided by half minus one. So if you have an eight-way box, set this to three. That way you don't have single runaway queries that are very large start blocking out all of the other smaller queries. And then the permissions page is for setting permissions and security at a server-wide basis. Something else worth pointing out about the server node is that when a server is selected, the summary tab under the reports, we'll have a number of interesting reports, as you can see. Moving on to the database node, the first node under databases is system databases, where Microsoft hides the system databases, master model, MSDB, and tempdb. The master database stores information about the different databases and about the environment of SQL Server. You can think of the model database as a template database. Whenever you create a new user database, it's actually a copy of the model database that creates that new user database. MSDB keeps track of the jobs, the histories, history of backup, that type of information. And tempdb is the temporary database which is shared by all of the users and all of the databases whenever any work is done in tempdb, either explicitly by creating a table in tempdb or implicitly when the query optimizer automatically uses tempdb. This is the database where that takes place. There is a fifth hidden system database which is used to keep track of resources. It's information that used to be part of master but was broken out 
to make it easier to move forward and backward through service packs so they could make a service pack change to master and not mess up resource or vice versa. I'm going to go ahead and close the system databases now that I've shown you what they're for.